Hi, I'm Jay Resnick. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and uh, I've been uh, practicing for about 25 years in Tarzana, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, a lot has changed in the last 25 years since I started practicing, since I finished my residency. And um, one of the biggest changes in dentistry and medicine is in technology. And this technology has had a profound effect on the practices of some of us and not so much yet on others. But it really has changed the way that we do everything in our practices for those of us who have uh, incorporated uh, digital technology, uh, including cone beam CT, into our practices. And so I want to share with you some of my experiences and some of my thoughts. The way that I was trained to do implants was the standard way that they were teaching 25 years ago and the way that it's still being taught now and that is we got a panoramic radiograph and from that we calculated with a 25% uh, magnification what length of implant we could safely place and if there was enough room easy distally. Uh, this gave us some very limited information uh, but we used that for our treatment planning. Uh, that was kind of our mainstay study. Um, maybe we got some study models. So maybe we actually thought of including a little bit of information about a final uh, prosthesis in the plan. And sometimes we also possibly made a surgical guide that would be used in surgery in order to help uh, determine the position where the implant or implants were going to be placed. Um, this is a great case that illustrates how that works and how well that has worked in my practice. This is a 67-year-old woman who is the mother of a dentist friend of mine, and she was at home and tripped and fell and fractured teeth numbers 8 and 9 at the CEJ. Her son determined that these teeth were not restorable, and so the plan was to then take these teeth out and replace them with immediate implants. So back in 2005, which is when I did this case, um, her son, being a good dentist, uh, made me a surgical guide that showed me the position of the final restorative plan that he had in mind to replace these two missing teeth. And you can see the channels that are going through both of those acrylic prostheses on this stent. And this is to direct me as to where the, my pilot drill should be placed for placing these implants. And as you can see, I did a pretty good job. These implants were very nicely spaced, very nicely positioned and placed. And this went on to be restored very successfully. Well, I saw the patient back last year, 14 years after we had done this case, and it still looks good today. We used um, external hex, uh, non-platform shifted implants at the time, because that's what was available. And as you can see, we have got uh, you know, really a pretty nice gingival contour. We've got interdental papillas. Uh, the tissue looks healthy, and everything really looks pretty good. So these techniques can be very successful. But the thing is, it's not really all that simple, and that's because our patients exist in three dimensions. They're not flat pieces of wood. So we have to worry about things like anatomy, like the patient's uh, opposing dentition. We have to worry about mandibular nerve. We have to worry about lingual nerve. We have to worry about the maxillary sinus. We have to worry about the roots and the position of the adjacent teeth. So all that information has to be used in order to treatment plan our implants. And what we find over time is that these traditional uh, techniques that we use for planning our implants, the clinical exam, panoramic radiographs, and study models, uh, really sometimes were misleading of the patient's true clinical anatomy. And that really ran into some problems and undermined what we were trying to do for our patients. So the, one of the reasons is that two-dimensional imaging is very limited, and it's limited by the fact that depending on the relationship of structures front to back, uh, what's closer to the x-ray source versus the, um, the receiver of the image of those photons, and how dense each image is, 
or each object is, or I, uh, uh, anatomy, that can profoundly affect what this radiograph is going to look like. And so in this two-dimensional image illustrates really well, you can see how um, it looks as if this uh, gentleman's head is inside this dinosaur's mouth, where we know in fact that it's not, that he's not even really close to it. But because of the angle of the camera and superimposition of these structures and the dinosaur head being denser and in front of uh, this gentleman's head, we get this uh, appearance. And if uh, you want to see another example, this is another favorite of mine, um, that we can see that two-dimensional imaging can really be deceptive of what's really going on in our patients and in the world in 3D. And so 3D imaging is critically important for knowing our patient's anatomy, for accurately planning implants, for avoiding surgical and other complications, and accurate implant placement is essential for predictable prosthetic restoration. We can't, you know, if we don't get the implant in the right place, it's really hard to do a predictable, successful restoration that's going to have good long-term success. So, 3D imaging really does make a huge difference that really changes the game, and this is a great example. I had been doing um, guided implant surgery on a limited cases using the medical CT in my building for uh, a couple years. And I finally um, ordered my uh, cone beam CT, my Galileos. And um, it was on order, ready to come in. And this patient, uh, as you can see here, I had taken out tooth number 31 approximately four to five months before and done bone grafting. Uh, to build up the site, ridge preservation grafting, so I could do the implant there. And, you know, back in 2008, before my Galileos arrived, I did my very um, sophisticated treatment planning. You can see here, I've used my wax pencil to indicate the, um, the crown, the implant position. I used my 25% magnification ruler to uh, determine that I could fit a 13 millimeter long implant in this site. I've marked out the nerve. It's at least two to three millimeters away from there. Um, and you can see the super eruption of these other teeth, the maxillary teeth that are opposing um, in the interim during the healing period. They're now gonna have to be modified uh, by this patient's dentist. So I got a call that my Galileos was ready for delivery. And I thought before we do this case, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to use the new technology that I have. I'm going to use my cone beam since I'm going to have it in the office for this simple case. Before this, I was really doing more complicated cases uh, with cone beam or with, uh, with CT rather and guided implant surgery and, and doing the more routine cases uh, the way that I learned in residency. Well, it's fortunate that uh, I got my Galileos when I did before I did this case because as you can see here, this is the panoramic projection of our cone beam CT of our Galileo. So you can see the radio opaque pontic and the radiograph extent in place. You can see my mapping of the mandibular nerve. If you look at the measurement, you know, there's actually, it says there's about 16 millimeters of space uh, between the, uh, the, uh, the top of the ridge and the mandibular nerve. So, um, great, a 13 millimeter implant would be perfect because we used to think back then longer was better. Well, it's really fortunate that I had my cone beam CT installed because had I placed a 13 millimeter implant, it would have been a disaster because as you can see, this implant would have perforated um, into the lingual fossa, the mylohyoid fossa on the lingual side of the mandible in this region. And so there wasn't actually 13 millimeters of bone. There was much less. In fact, I ended up having to do a, a 10 millimeter implant in this site. If I had done a 13 millimeter implant, don't forget there's, <laughs> well, first of all, this implant would have perforated out the lingual cortex, which means it might have perforated the lingual mucosa and it would have failed. And that's if I was lucky. If I wasn't as lucky, I would have perforated or damage the lingual nerve, the lingual vein, or even the lingual artery. And that would have been a really serious complication that was avoided by knowing my anatomy in 3D. So the issues that we see with 
traditional implant surgery, the way that I was taught with a panoramic and study models, is that a lot of times you would have these things, you would flap open the site, and you would see the bone wasn't exactly where you thought it was. It was maybe a little bit more lingual, or the ridge felt pretty, pretty broad, but when you flapped it open, it was more of a narrow ridge with a lot of fibrous tissue. And so sometimes you had to modify the implant position or angulation to some extent to get it to line up where you thought it should be. And so the implant was placed where the bone was. And then the restorative aspect, the restorative uh, uh, procedure to put a tooth on top of this implant became kind of an afterthought. And sometimes this was far less than favorable. And as uh, if you're a restorative dentist, you certainly have gotten cases back from your surgical specialists who've placed implants for you and wondered how the hell or why they put the implant where they did because it's difficult if not impossible for you to restore. So we have to kind of step back and ask ourselves some questions. First of all, why do we place implants? Well, the simple answer is that we, re we place implants in order to replace missing teeth and restore patient's dentition and oral and facial function. And so to do that, we have to ask ourselves, what are our expectations? What are we looking for uh, when we are doing our implant treatment? What benchmarks are we going to use to define successful implant treatment? Um, how are we going to get there? And what tools are we going to use to deliver success? And that's critically important. So the first benchmark is we want to have predictability in our treatment planning and in our, in our implant surgery. So that means that when we place an implant or replace tooth number 12, 95% of the time, Long, you know, it's gonna, the implant's going to be there long term and healthy and successful and giving function and aesthetics to that patient. If we need to do a sinus lift, we want to know that if we place, let's say, three millimeters of bone into the maxillary sinus, that that's going to give us, you know, eight to ten millimeters of additional bone height that we can use to place our implant. We want to have predictability. But there's something that is a, kind of an offshoot of predictability that is even more important. And that has to do with the fact that we as implant surgeons, as clinicians, are all human. And so it really doesn't matter whether you are a, you know, placing an implant or in sports and in the Olympics. It doesn't matter how well-trained you are, how experienced you are, how wonderful you are, that when you connect your mind to your hand and your body, you sometimes miss the mark. And that is just the nature of doing things with our hands and our body. So the other benchmark we want to have is we want to have consistency. We want to know that when we plan our implant to be in exactly this position for this uh, restorative plan, that the implant will consistently be successful in that site and predictably successful. And so we have to get the implant in the right place. We have to, we have to make that consistency a higher priority. And you can see here that you know, these are cases that were done by very talented, very experienced clinicians where the implants weren't placed where they needed to be. And like I said, you've experienced this. If you've placed implants yourself, you probably have had the same experience where you thought you were placing the implant in the ideal site, but you get your post-op radiograph or go to expose the implants for second stage, and they're just not accurately placed. And that, you know, is a problem that we need to do something about. The other benchmark we want to have in our implant treatment is we want to have efficiency. And I learned in my general surgery residency that efficiency doesn't mean that you're moving fast, that your hands are going quickly. What it means is you're conserving your movement so you can do the same surgery, the same procedure, more efficiently in less time. So less clinical time, to, to do the surgery, less surgical time. And the result of that is that you're inflicting less surgical trauma on your patient. And as a result, 
they will have an easier recovery and a better experience. So those are the things that we want to have. Okay? So how do we achieve this kind of predictability, consistency, and efficiency in our implant treatment? Well, we do that by changing our philosophy. We change our concept of implantology, implant surgery, from being this surgically driven implant placement where the surgeon places the implant and then sends it off to be restored. And we replace that with prosthetically driven implant placement. And what does that mean? That means that we start with the ideal prosthetic restoration and then we work backwards from there in order to develop the plan of where the implant should be placed. If we need to augment the bone or modify the bone, we know that ahead of time. If we need to do soft tissue procedures, we know all that ahead of time. It's just like building a house. Okay, If you're building a house or a new office or whatever it may be, any structure, you're going to have a plan ahead of time, a very detailed plan that shows exactly what the framing is going to look like, what materials are going to be used, where the plumbing and electrical are going to go, where the toilets are going to be, where the light switches are going to be. You don't just get a bunch of buddies together with some building materials and some hammers and nails and a keg and say, let's build a house, because if you do, you're going to get something that's not very aesthetic, not very functional, and it's really not going to last very long. And this is the way we've been doing implants for you know as long as I can remember since I learned implants in my residency. Guided implant surgery has changed the game for me. I do every single one of my implants in my practice, oh, let's say 99.9% .9 fully guided. And I've done thousands and thousands of implants in my career. Guided implant surgery is where we start with a prosthetically driven plan. We start with the final restoration and we work backwards to determine where the implant is going to be placed. And this is done with a 3D image on a cone beam CT. And then we make a surgical guide from the software data that is either printed or milled stereolithographically. And this surgical guide controls the position, the angulation, and the depth of each implant drill and of the implant fixture itself. And so this has really revolutionized implantology. Implant surgery, when it's done fully guided, is been demonstrated to be significantly more accurate than freehand implant placement. It's been shown to be significantly more accurate than if you use a, a prosthetically based, model-based guide with just a pilot, hill, a pilot uh, drill path. Okay? Every study has shown no matter how experienced you are, whether it's a fully edentulous case, partially edentulous case, or a single tooth, guided implant surgery reduces the amount of variation between the plan and the final implant position by a factor of three to five, depending on the study. And studies have shown that this accuracy can be down to less than 1% degree of angulation and less than a half a millimeter of position in either direction. So this is, this is incredibly accurate um, compared to freehand implant placement. So when I ask my colleagues who have been doing implants for a number of years, you know, why don't you do guided implant surgery? With all the technologies available now, how easy it is to use the software um, and how prevalent this technology is in practice, why don't you do guided surgery? And I get the same answers every single time. Well, I've been doing implants for more than 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or whatever it may be. And gosh, I'm really good at it. And so why should I learn a new way of doing implant surgery? Well, the basic answer to that is that in the last 25 years, technology has changed. It's allowed us to do things better and more accurately and more efficiently. And, you know, are you still using the same cell phone? I had one just like this when I was through residency. It was in a suitcase. I had to carry it with me. You know, so it was back in, back in the 80s, late, late 80s, or yeah, late 80s, early 90s. And, 
you know, do you still use, a, do you still have a tube TV set? This, is, this was my Trinitron 27 inch color TV. Great TV for the technology in 1985, but that's not what I have now. I've got my big screen flat LCD or plasma screen TV, and it's a better picture, a better experience. So if you're still, if you're still using those technologies in your practice, you know, I guess you can still do implants the way that you used to. But for those of us who have you know, adopted new technology in our lives, we should be doing the same in our practices. For me, my light bulb, light bulb moment came in 2005. So my practice, uh, I have a study club where my referrals come and uh, come to learn, and we have every month. And in 2005, we had a speaker that came to my study club and he brought a video showing a Swedish gentleman walking into a dental clinic with a bag of his old dentures and walking out in a couple hours with a full arch of implants and a final prosthesis. This was called, this was the Nobel teeth in an hour system. And something about that just set, set off a light bulb in my head. And I said, this is the future of implantology and I am gonna learn that. In 2007, Nobel Guide came to the United States and I signed up for one of the first classes. I went and took it and then came back to my office and looked for my first case to do. Well, as it turns out, it was a fully edentulous patient who I had uh, edentulated uh, about uh, four months before and done bone grafting and alveoloplasty to get nice ridges and, and techniques to preserve her keratinized gingiva. And she came back and for her, I did 16 implants and the final upper and lower prostheses. And this took me, the entire procedure took three hours, a little under three hours to do, which just blew my mind away. When I looked at the post-op radiograph, every implant position was absolutely perfect, perfectly spaced, perfectly positioned. And even more amazing, I had done this, as I said, I, I preserved uh, all the keratinized tissue. I was able to do this flaplessly. This patient came back after this surgery and she said she took like maybe two Advil twice and that was it. She had an incredibly easy post-op recovery and at that point, that's when I started doing guided implant surgery on these more complicated cases. Uh, and then in 2007 or 2008, I, rather, I got my, uh, my Galileos and from that time forward, I've been doing everything uh, fully guided. Digitally integrated workflow is really a, uh, an advance that has come into my practices and other practices. So I have also uh, the CEREC CAD CAM, I've got the CEREC milling unit, and I've got 3D printers in my office. And I use this integration of technologies in my practice in order to benefit my patients, to improve my workflow, improve my accuracy, my predictability, my efficiency, and get great results for my patients. So the way that the workflow works with Galileo's guided surgery is we get our cone beam CT, we go ahead and we do our optical scan if we have a CEREC scanner in our office, uh, or you can do this with uh, you know, whatever system you have, you have if you have a CAD CAM system. And in the system we create from the dental arch a prosthetic proposal. So this is our proposed restorative result. So in this case, we're replacing tooth number 19, which has been extracted previously about uh, six months before. Uh, we plan our prosthetic proposal. We then bring together the two sets of data, the CAD CAM, excuse me, the CAD CAM data and the cone beam data in a very simple intuitive step. This is what I love about the, uh, the Galileo implant software is it's so easy and intuitive. Um, I never even picked up a manual. I just started picking, I picked up the mouse and started using it. And so what we do is we correlate between the cone beam CT and the CAD CAM optical impression, we correlate points. So here we're gonna correlate tooth number 18 with tooth number 18, tooth number 22 with tooth number 22 and so on. And we, we correlate three to five points depending on 
Um, you know, if the patient has, a, has some uh, metallic artifact from prostheses in their mouth, we usually tend to use more points. Uh, the computer then brings these two uh, data sets together, and then we're given the opportunity to make sure that it's knit these two uh, well together. And once we've verified that, it brings us back to the implant planning software. And we're now able to plan our implant um, digitally based on where that prosthetic proposal is located. So we click on this little icon right here, which shows a little implant under a crown. And when we do that, it brings up the place implant uh, menu, which allows us to select the implant system we're going to use. See how it already knows we're tooth number 19. Um, it will come up, the default will show the last implant that we plan, but we want to change that for this site. So we're going to use an Astrotech uh, TX implant in, in this area. And we have, you can see here, it shows us what implant lengths and diameters are available in that implant system and whether this is a guided compatible system. It's got that little sleeve icon. And we select the implant system length and diameter that we want to use and we click OK and this automatically gets pasted or placed under that prosthetic proposal into the jawbone. Now it's not the final position, okay, it's just the computer just places it there, but then we're going to go back and we're going to fine tune that position so that the implant is lined up exactly where it needs to be for the prosthesis, but also is adequately spaced between the adjacent teeth, the um, buccal and lingual bone, and is aligned at the uh, parallel to the adjacent teeth. We can then, if we want to, we can change the implant diameter, the implant length, uh, with a simple drop-down menu. And then once we have decided uh, that this is our final choice for our implant um, diameter, size, position, etc., we can print out a little uh, report. And I usually uh, print this out. If you have an all digital system, you can save it as a PDF to go in your records. Uh, we print it out and it goes uh, actually in the room uh, when we're doing the implant surgery, we have it posted up. And then we can go ahead and we order the implant surgical guide online and we select what type of implant guide we wanna use. And there are rules for which one is the best choice that um, I'll talk about the different choices in a minute. And we go through the steps, we order it online. Um, it will then uh, save the data in a way that uh, transfers all the, not only the cone beam, but the CAD CAM data. It's uploaded, and then you are taken to the CCAT website where you upload the data. And you know, depending on what guide, type of guide you use, the guide either is delivered to you by FedEx about a week later, or can be done locally. And um, so this is the surgical guide that was used for this case that I just showed you planning. So this is what's called a, an opti guide in this case. And you can see this is a milled guide. And right here, right there, this is the most important element of the surgical guide. And that is um, the sleeve or what's called the tube that goes in the surgical guide. And it's this tube that allows you or allows the guide to control the position, angulation, and depth of each drill and each implant that's placed. This is the Astrotech EV guided surgery system. As you can see, it's very simply laid out. It's very intuitive. It's color coded. It's got uh, cheat sheets right here. Um, so it tells you exactly which drills you're going to need for which implant length, diameter, etc. And these drills are unique in it's got what's called a sleeve on drill system. So you can see how the, there's a sleeve right here. And if you look at these drills, um, all of these drills have a sleeve on them. The inner diameter of that sleeve is different depending on the diameter of the drill, but that outer sleeve is the same diameter and that's what goes into the tube of the surgical guide and allows you to control the drill as well as the implant placement. So with the Astrotech EV system, this is how it works. And this is the current system uh, that uh, Densply Serona uh, is selling. And we start off the procedure 
with a tissue punch if we've got adequate keratinized tissue. And that goes right through the drill. You can see how well that tissue punch um, is controlled. And then we have our initial drill which starts the osteotomy and removes that tissue plug from inside the osteotomy. We then start with our number one drill which you can see the sleeve here goes right on the drill and controls the position, angulation, and depth of that first drill. And then our second drill is the number three drill and again goes to the full depth and widens the oste osteotomy a little further. And then the final drill which is the number three drill which is our last osteotomy to get the diameter that we want uh, which is uh, 0.5 millimeters under drilled from the size of the dia uh, diameter of the implant. Then we're going to remove a little bit of bone at the crestal area to re relieve some of the pressure with this A or B drill and then a little bit of bone at the apical portion with a V or with a V drill, which again releases some of the pressure um, in the osteotomy and is, is thought to uh, help imp uh, increase implant uh, longevity and implant success. We then take the implant out of the carrier uh, or out of the uh, out of the container with the implant driver, and this goes to the predetermined depth. Uh, on the implant driver. There's two marks depending on the implant length. And then you can see the timing mark on this implant driver, on this implant mount. Uh, whether if we're doing a stock abutment or if we're doing an Atlantis abutment, that has a single position uh, for rotation or timing. And we use that other, this other mark here for that. So very precisely controlled. And uh, then if we're doing multiple implants, we've got this little uh, stabilization uh, mount that can go in. And um, uh, that's basically how guided implant surgery works. And you can see how it really increases the efficiency. You're not taking radiographs between osteotomies, making sure that it's well positioned and deep enough and not, you know, contact, not too close to the adjacent roots. It's just boom, 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 and you're done. And this is our post-op radiograph. And then about two years later, I saw the patient for follow-up, and you can see he's had a little dentistry done in the interim. But our bone levels look great, as good as when the implant was placed. And we've got a great aesthetic result, um, great functional result, because this implant was placed based on the prosthetic plan and using Galileo's guided implant surgery to place the implant accurately. A little more difficult case is when you're in the anterior aesthetic zone. So this is a patient of mine who, as you can see, had a uh, uh, traumatized this tooth when he was young. He's got a crown on tooth number eight. Um, it's had previous root canal. He's got some gingival recession. He's got a little fistula and he had apical surgery and the tooth is failing. And you can see here why. This tooth is basically at the end of the road. So we want to take this tooth out and ideally we would like to replace this tooth with an immediate implant, bone graft around it, and an immediate provisional restoration because our studies show us that when we case select and we place our implants accurately, Immediate implant surgery is just as successful as when we do delayed implant placement and tooth replacement. Okay? And every single study shows that not only is it as successful, but you get better maintenance of bony and soft tissue architecture. So we try to do this whenever we can. The problem is that this is a challenge, no matter how experienced you are. When we take out a tooth in the anterior aesthetic zone, we are left with a socket. And the socket looks like this. If we're going to plan our implant based on the final prosthesis and we want to do a screw retained restoration, we're going to plan our implant so that it's angled in, not in that socket, but it's got to have at least two millimeters of bone on the buckle, two millimeters of bone on the lingual, and it's got to be angled uh, uh, consistent with the cingulum area on the tooth. And so this is where we want to place this implant. The problem is when we do an immediate implant and we do it freehand, we've got our socket. And we take our start drill, our pilot drill, and what we want to do is we want to then drill this exactly in this spot, exactly at the angle that we want, 
and we've got bone on one side and we've got air on the other. So it doesn't matter how experienced you are, sometimes, about 10 to 15 percent of the time, that drill drifts and it goes towards the apex of that socket and you end up drilling your osteotomies here. And then the implant is off position, off angle, and too close to the buccal cortex, which then will end up down the road with bone loss, pain, and failure. And so this is not how we want to do our implants. Anterior aesthetic zone is really a critical spot. So we want to use our digital technology to place these implants accurately and predictably. And so here is this patient's plan. And you can see I planned his implant based on the final prosthetic plan. So I've got my implant positioning. We go ahead and order the surgical guide. The guide comes back. And I'm going to take that guide and I'm going to uh, place an implant analog using an implant uh, analog holder into a study model. So now we have basically a master model of where this implant is going to be placed at the time of surgery. And so before surgery, I can use my digital workflow with my CEREC by placing a tie base and a scan body on that master model. I can now plan the ideal prosthesis for my provisional restoration in addition. So I've planned the implant placement based on the final restoration. Now I'm planning, I'm going to be milling a provisional restoration in my office based on that implant. And so uh, the software will generate that prosthetic proposal and then we modify it based on our needs. So in this case being that it is a uh, provisional restoration for the anterior, uh, for an immediate implant, we want to take it at least a millimeter or two out of occlusion so we can make those adjustments and um, uh, so, we, so that our, our final rest, our provisional restoration is going to be exactly the way we design it to go in at the time of surgery and be out of occlusion. So we can go ahead and finalize our restorative position and here is our milling preview. And we're going to then send that to our milling unit and we get our provisional restoration which we're then going to attach onto that tie base and it's now ready for this patient to go to surgery. So here I'm taking this tooth out atraumatically. Patient's been started on antibiotics uh, two days before. We're going to thoroughly debride out this surgical site before we place an implant and a bone graft. So thoroughly curette this out. Remove all the granulation tissue. You can see that little, there's a little fistula right there in the tissue. And so we're going to have to deal with that. So we're thoroughly curetting this out, thoroughly irrigating it. And now we're going to place our implant doing fully guided surgery. This is a, uh, one of the a classic, called a classic guide that we're using for this patient. And we're going to protect our airway. And we're going to start with our First drill, this is the um, Astrotech uh, TX system, uh, known as Facilitate. And we're going to be placing our, doing our first osteotomy with lots of irrigation and light pressure. Uh, we're going to do our second osteotomy to widen that osteotomy again. And then we're going to do our next osteotomy with the final drill key. And then we'll be ready to place the implant. So again, we do this with lots of irrigation, gentle uh, and gentle, uh, gentle pressure. Now we're developing or placing the implant after we thoroughly irrigated out the site. The implant goes to the depth determined on the implant mount, which has Again, timing marks on it so we can line it up perfectly for how we lined up that implant analog in our model. And we're going to go completely to depth. We're going to adjust the final timing um, with a hand wrench so that uh, we're fully seated and our timing is exactly where we want it to be. We're going to take the implant mount off, uh, which is what we did with the TX system. And now you can see the implant is perfectly positioned exactly where we'd planned. 
we're going to put a cover screw on it temporarily and we're going to get our bone uh, bone graft material which in this case is going to be a gel and we're going to pack it around this uh, around the implant we're going to in order to uh, in order to close off that fistula and, and keep the graft intact, I'm going to place a little barrier membrane between the bone and the periosteum. And here, actually, we're using bone granules. I'm going to place the bone granules um, into a, the defect around the implant, so the space between the implant and the uh, socket of the tooth that we removed. And we're going to then pack it in, clean off the cover screw so we can see it, but it's all packed in so it's nice and, and stable. Uh, then we can take off our, our cover screw and come back with the provisional restoration that we again made ahead of time uh, in the office and it's ready to go in at surgery and you can see that it goes in with absolutely no adjustment and you can see how much this saves us time in surgery, it makes our surgical time much more efficient because we're not messing with uh, trying to place a provisional uh, and adjust a provisional restoration in surgery. It's already ready to go. So the provisional restoration goes to place. We're gonna check the occlusion on it and everything is good. Then we're gonna torque it down to 20 Newton centimeters and we'll be ready to go. So everything looked good, no occlusion on this at all. And you can see this is our uh, post-surgical uh, radiograph. In this case, we did a, a cone beam CT. And you can see that implant placement is absolutely perfect. This is the patient at two weeks post-op. You can see where um, that fistula was. You had some dieback of, of the mucosa. Uh, and you can see the collagen barrier poking through. Over time, this is two months later that uh, epithelializes over as the collagen membrane disappears. And when the patient came back, approximately uh, saw him about a year later, you can see that everything is completely healed over. We've got great soft tissue contours, great soft tissue health. The, right here is where the fistula was. Um, it's a little redder because the tissue is a little bit thinner, uh, but it's, it's very healthy tissue and it's a great result, okay? As far as the surgical guides that you can use with, um, with the uh, Densply Serona Cone Beam CT systems, there are four different options. And the first is the classic guide. So this is the classic guide, which is what you saw in that surgery I just did. And this is uh, for doctors who don't have CAD CAM in their office, or if you've got a patient who has a lot of metal restorations in their mouth because that causes a lot of scatter, and hard, it makes it hard to bring the CAD CAM and cone beam images together. This guide right here, this is a, um, a, an Opti guide. That's what you saw on the case for number 19 that I showed you. This is a completely digital guide. All the data is uploaded to Germany and the guide is milled in at, at CCAT in Germany and then sent to you. This is a digital guide and the digital guide is a guide that is 3D printed locally. And that can be either in a local lab uh, that has uh, 3D printing capabilities in your area, or if you have a 3D printer in your office, you can actually 3D print this in your own office and then put the sleeve in that you get from CCAT. And right here, this is a CEREC 3 guide. And this guide is milled on CEREC, on your CEREC mill from a large, from a maxi block. And, um, and can be used for uh, basically, you, uh, whereas with the uh, workflow, this takes about a week, this takes a couple days. Um, you can have a surgical guide the same day as you do the planning with the CEREC guide, um, but it's limited to basically single implants. It's also only limited to three implant systems, all are Densply Serona implants. So that would be the Astrotech EV, uh, the Zive and the Freelit. The other thing this technology allows us to do is to expand our treatment possibilities and improve the efficiency and predictability of our implant treatment. And so this is Jake. Jake is a healthy 17 year old who was uh, having some fun during the summer in his backyard, decided to do a cannonball into his swimming pool and as he tucked and hit the water 
his tooth number eight went into his thigh right here. And so you can see how tooth number eight is displaced. And radiographically, you can see that uh, not only is the, uh, the crown displaced, but there's a fracture at the junction of the apical and middle third of that root. So this tooth is not restorable. We're gonna be taking it out and we would like to place an immediate implant. Now, because of some of the fracture of the bone around this site, because of the trauma, I wasn't comfortable doing a, 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 an immediate restoration, immediate provisional on this tooth. So we're gonna place the implant graft around it and then provide um, Jack, uh, Jake with a removable uh, prosthesis. Now, if I got an impression for study models to do this, of course, that would probably pull that tooth out and we didn't want to do that. So what we did was we used our CEREC and we optically scanned uh, the existing position of the tooth for planting the implant and then used the uh, export of the STL file of his maxillary and mandibular arches in order to print models. So these are printed models in the office that were then sent to the lab to create his removable prosthesis. So here we are at the surgery taking the tooth out. Um, you can see uh, that it's fractured in the apical third and then using proximator to uh, atraumatically remove what's left of uh, the root apex. And so we've, we've luxated, loosened it, and now it can be removed just with a, with a hemostat. We're then gonna thoroughly cure it out the site and uh, debride it of any PDL remnants, any granulation tissue, thoroughly irrigate, and then place our implant using the EV guided system. And then place our implant again through the surgical guide, place it to the correct depth and timing, place a cover screw on the implant itself, and we can, again, get a sense that this implant is nice and solid. And then we're going to use a bone gel to graft around the implant, fill in that space between the implant and the uh, alveolar bone, alveolar socket, place a collagen membrane, suture that in place, and then use a cyanoacrylate tissue cement to seal this up. We let it heal. We take out the stitches after about two weeks, deliver his flipper, and here we are post-op. This is our implant uh, peri 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 periapical radiograph. And here we are at about a month and a half post-op. You can see how uh, everything is healing over nicely. And at last visit, we are now four months out. We went to second stage. I did a, uh, a repositioning flap in order to expose the implant, place a healing abutment, and suture it back. Um, to preserve all the keratinized gingiva in the anterior aesthetic zone, and I'm waiting uh, to see him back with his final restoration. So I hope you've seen that this digitally integrated workflow has completely changed the game of how I and others like me, whether they're specialists or general practitioners, uh, do their dentistry, do their implant treatment. It really is a great tool to improve the efficiency, the accuracy, and the predictability of what we do. So I thank you for your time. I hope you've learned a little bit. I think you're, hope you're a little bit inspired to want to learn a little bit more about guided implant surgery and the integration of these digital technologies and bring them into your practice. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer your emails. Uh, my email is right here, uh, j at onlineoralsurgery.com. And uh, again, I thank you for your attention and uh, uh, wish you the best of uh, success in your implant journey. Thanks a lot.